Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Office Boy Caden. I'm Gaynor. I'm Sophie. And today we've got a full timeline of the North Hollywood shoes out. Mm. I'm not sure what this is. I have no idea what this is, to be honest with you. Yeah, we're going in blind to this one. We no. are going in very yeah. blind. We just saw this on YouTube and thought, ooh, yeah, why not? What is the North Hollywood shoot out? I guess we'll find out. Is it a cowboy movie? What? <laughs> I'm hoping this is real life, to be honest. I, yeah, I think it'll be a, a real life event. Yeah, let's, let's have a look. Yeah. Let's take a look. <laughs> February 28, 1997. Two men exit a 1987 Chevy Celebrity sedan outside of a Bank of America branch in North Hollywood. The men are heavily armored, both wielding large semi-automatic rifles. The two individuals in question are a pair of bank robbers, and they're coming to enact a major heist worth some $750,000. However, as they enter the facility, unbeknownst to them, they're spotted by an LAPD patrol car driving nearby. The officers in the car call for backup, and for the next 44 minutes, one of the most bloody events in American history would unfold. The year is 1989. Two men, both with mutual interests, meet each other in the Gold's Gym in Venice, California. The two men are Larry Phillips Jr., born in 1970, and Echebal Matsuranu, born in 1966. The two men were interested in topics like weightlifting and firearms, and so they stuck up a friendship with each other. The two also had a common trait. They were both unsuccessful in business. Phillips was a repeat shoplifter and scam artist working within the field of real estate, while his friend ran an honest computer repair business, although it too was a failed venture. Over the years, the two would get closer and closer as friends and engage in multiple robberies with each other. And with that came the infamous day of February 28, 1997, eight years after the two had met in that gym. What preceded the day was months upon months of preparations, which included finding a target, obtaining a wide variety of firearms, constructing illegal weapons, and planning an attack. The two men were about to commit a bank robbery. It's currently the early morning hours of February 28. The two men had chosen a main target to hit, a Bank of America branch operating on Laurel Canyon Boulevard in North Hollywood. Philip and his partner had a wide variety of tools at their disposal, including two semi-automatic HK-91s, a pair of illegally converted Norinco Type 56S rifles, as well as two fully automatic weapons, a Norinco Type 56S1 and a Bushmaster XM-15 Dissipator. However, guns weren't the only things they brought with them to the robbery. They also brought with them layers of safety equipment. For Phillips, he went all in, wearing some 40 pounds of armor to cover his entire body, including a Type 3A bulletproof vest, custom-made armor to cover his uncovered portions, a groin guard, and another vest layer. Matasaranu wore a single Type 3A vest and a ballistic plate underneath. They were planning for the worst-case scenario. This is absolutely like... Plan to the to the T, isn't it? They're not going. You're in. not wearing them unless you're expecting to like get shot. Shot, yeah. Crazy. Which obviously, you know, the the police in the US are are armed and and, and they're going to use it. But yeah. wow, they use reasonable force. They, they, they don't must seem be to have any. Bad to do that. Yeah, they obviously don't seem to have any fear or no desperation. That's not me. I think they've got nothing to lose, really, no. have they? In order to track the timing on their plan, as that was a crucial element of it, they'd also sewn watches on the backs of their gloves. With their 1987 Chevy Celebrity parked outside the bank, it was now time to undergo the plan. First and foremost, the two men took phenobarbital pills, a kind of muscular sedative, in order to ease their nerves going into this high-level crime. The coroner's toxicology lab later found that the men had multiple other substances in their systems, including nerval stimulants, appetite suppressants, and even anti-seizure medication. The time is currently 9.16 a.m. Prior to the robbery, Phillips had utilized a radio scanner in order to monitor police transmissions around the area, and had found that they had an approximate time frame of about eight minutes, setting their watch as such. However, even with their highly calculated plan, things began to go wrong from the very start. As upon their entering the banking facility, two LAPD officers happened to be passing by the exact area at that time, and immediately reported the two men. The officers in question, Lauren Farrell and Martin Perello, reported a possible code 211 in progress. The police were already on their way. 
However, the robbery did go down as planned. The two men entered the bank and forced down a customer, leaving an ATM lobby at the entrance doors. Upon seeing the two armed men in full tactical gear, a security guard attempted to contact his partner, who was sitting outside the building, to call 911. However, this call for help was never received on the other end, and Matasaranu fired into the ceiling as a form of intimidation, while Phillips yelled to the bank patrons, quote, This is a holdup. 30 staff members and civilians watched from the floor as Matasaranu fired upon the bulletproof door to the bank vault. The door was designed to only withstand low-velocity bullets, and so when faced with a powerful semi-auto, it immediately broke open, giving them access to the master vault. They then picked up and forced a man named John Villagrana, the bank's assistant manager, to open it up for them and fill their bags with money. However, there was a major noticeable problem. Over half the money wasn't even there. That morning, a change had been made in the bank's delivery schedule, leading to only around $303,305 to be in the vault at that time, versus the $750,000 they were expecting. Now filled with rage, Manasaranu opened fire into the vault after it had been emptied, causing any remaining money to be destroyed. When the two tried opening the ATM as a way to make up for the difference, they found this couldn't be done, as corporate policy change had made it so that the managers lost their access to the inside of the machine. They fled the building with two things, less than half of the money they expected to get, and a set of dye packs that ended up destroying the rest. Outside the building, the two officers now make an immediate call to report that shots had been fired. More shots are being fired from inside the bank. Officers from North Hollywood PD arrive on the scene, strategically positioning themselves outside the facility, covering the bank's four corners, and setting up a makeshift perimeter between them. It's now 9.24 a.m. This is mad interesting, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is really interesting, and I, I've just seen it's a 2003 then. I yeah, think that, that was the movie. That yeah. was the movie about oh, okay, right. All right. Called 44 Minutes or something. Well, I say I've not heard of it. Normally, I would have heard of it. No, I've never heard of this, and I'm, I'm quite into like, my crime. Yeah. And... yeah. Yeah, I love anything like that. I'm expecting them to just start shooting each other now, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I'm, that's what I'm guessing that's what I've got the name from. Yeah, shoot out, yeah. <laughs> Although the two are currently on time, they are unaware of the police presence outside. Phillips exits the building's north doorway and immediately notes a police vehicle sitting only 200 feet from the door. He pulls out his rifle and begins to open fire on the car for several minutes, injuring nine people in the process. Three were civilians, two were detectives, three were officers, and one sergeant. Following the initial attack, Philip then spots a police helicopter hovering above, flown by Charles de Paraguay Jr., and he opens fire on that too, forcing it to move away from him. He retreats into the building and re-exits from the same door, while Matasaranu exits from the south exit. The two start trying to engage and distract LAPD officers, arbitrarily firing at patrol cars around the bank. Of course, officers proceeded to fire back, but were met with a number of immediate issues. For one, at the time, LAPD carried 12-gauge pump-action shotguns or 9mm Beretta handguns. Both of these guns, although deadly, were nowhere near powerful enough when compared to the layers of armor worn by the assailants. Furthermore, LAPD service guns had a low firing range, too low to fight back. In fact, at 9.35am, an unnamed officer stated on the police for- Why not just give them the best guns? What, the police? Yeah, especially in America. It doesn't It doesn't matter what guns they have, the criminals are always going to get bigger and better ones. They, they make their own ones. Because mm, they look like specialised guns. They don't look ones like you could just buy off. No. Do you know what I mean? But the thing is, if, if you're into guns, you can make your own guns and, and they're, ne they're never going to be. And the thing is, the police don't want to be walking around with these, like, rifles or these units that if, you know, God forbid something happens, and, the, and it goes the wrong way and it shoots an innocent person that it's not going to just shoot them, it's going to destroy them, so... Well, I mean, they carry yeah. shotguns there, don't they? Yeah, but a shotgun, you know, is not going to blow someone's head off if... Well, it will, but... It definitely yeah. would. It's the most powerful <laughs> bullet, isn't it? Mm -hmm. but, but I guess it's not as, like, kind of, like, quick as, like, say, like, an automatic... Yeah, semi-automatic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Rifle or something? Yeah. Yeah. You have to be kind of close for a shotgun as well. Yeah. 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 You can't use a shotgun mm -hmm. from distance. Well, I think shotguns are for, like, animals, aren't they? For, like, deer I'd or... I'd say more so, yeah. and stuff like that. I think so. 
frequency radio to, quote, not stop the getaway vehicle. They've got automatic weapons. There's nothing we have that can stop them. The unending stream of bullets emerging from the bank's entrance also added to this. The LAPD was completely stuck. As the firefight continued between both sides, Philip would begin to see a greater pushback from the officers, however, which was triggered by getting shot. Officer Richard Zylensky from the Valley Traffic Division runs toward the parking lot of an adjacent Del Taco chain restaurant, now standing a mere 350 feet from the active gunman. He proceeds to fire a shocking 86 rounds from his Beretta at Phillips, striking him multiple times. Zylensky's location was also strategic, as it served as a distraction to allow Sergeant Haynes and Officer Whitfield who had been injured in the firefight and had minimal coverage, to move to safe ground. The second major moment came when detectives Bancroft and Harley from the LAPD were able to get cover behind a cinder block wall in the backyard of a nearby residential home, 55 feet away. The two opened fire somewhere between 15 and 24 times at the gunman. Marasaranu then proceeds to back the pair's sedan out of its parking space and brings it towards the north exit, leading to Phillips being shot in the wrist and then in his rifle. This led to his weapon becoming inoperable, and he, as a result, quickly grabs another rifle from the trunk of their car. Things escalate exponentially when the LAPD receives a second officer down call from the scene. They respond with a tactical SWAT team. A small but heavily armed team made up of officers Donnie Anderson, Steve Gomez, Peter Weireter, and Richard Massa drives in around 9.42 a.m. It was a rather strange situation as the officers had gotten the call in the middle of a training run, and so they showed up to the scene of the standoff in a pair of sneakers and shorts. They proceeded to requisition an armored vehicle and began getting civilians out of the area, many of which were now heavily injured. Phillips wasn't the only one facing major complications, however. Marasoranu, still standing in the parking lot, is shot twice in the right leg and in his left forearm, making handling his gun difficult. He continues pushing on until a fourth bullet strikes his right eye socket, making it hard to see. He then ducks behind the hood of their car, dropping the bag of money and getting into the car to begin slowly moving it away. Phillips then grabs his HK-91 rifle and continues opening fire on the police while walking along the side of the vehicle. But this plan fails as he's shot in both the shoulder and the rifle receiver, rendering this one inoperable. Too. He attempts to fire a few more times before dropping this one and quickly getting his Norinco Type 56. Phillips would proceed to make what became a fatal mistake following this point. After retreating the parking lot and running into the street, his partner drives his vehicle into the road as well. At 9.52 a.m., Phillips would turn east on Archwood Street, taking cover behind a parked semi-truck. He continues to fire at officers until his gun jams, leading to him drawing his Beretta 92FS, which he continues shooting. The pushback from the officers was too much for him to take on, however, and he struck in his right hand, which leads to him dropping the gun. Unable to continue fighting back, Phillips picks up his pistol, places it underneath his chin, and opens fire. <laughs> Coupled with a gunshot to the spine by Officer John Caparelli, Phillips instantly dies. The police continue firing at him multiple times before surrounding the body. One of the gunmen is now down. Back to Manasaranu. His attempt at escaping through his vehicle fails, after it gets shot out multiple times. Now 9.56 a.m., the assailant runs toward a 1963 Jeep Gladiator down the road and shoots at the driver. The driver, realizing the gravity of the situation, runs out of the car, but pulls the kill switch on his way out, rendering it inoperable as well. Matasaranu, unaware of this, throws his weapons into the vehicle and makes an attempt at driving it, but not before he's surrounded by multiple news helicopters. He runs out of the car after realizing his situation and back towards the original Chevy sedan. Multiple members of the SWAT team that was dispatched earlier park near the Chevy, and Marasaranu proceeds to open fire on them. For the next two minutes and 30 seconds or so, he releases an unending stream of gunfire, this being arguably the most stressful part of the standoff. SWAT officer Donnie Anderson puts an end to this, however, when he uses the double tap technique to fire at Marasaranu. A double tap is a form of shooting in which an officer fires a high array of bullets at the exact same area, in this case being the gunman's chest armor. 
doesn't kill him, but it causes him to pause before he's shot in the lower legs by Anderson's AR-15. He eventually gives up and surrenders, putting his arms up, following the slew of injuries. With him now surrendering, multiple officers charge at him and pin him down to arrest him. They ask the man for his name, to which he says Pete, and then proceeds to yell at them obscenities, asking them to shoot him in the head. Paramedics wait outside the danger zone, as is standard protocol in high-stake events. In fact, they had to wait outside the area for over an hour, and Modestranu passed away well before that. It was alleged and proven during a trial against the LAPD following the shooting, however, that Officer James Wojtecki had in fact told the ambulance to quote, get the out of here. It was found that Montessoranu had been shot in the legs around 29 times, and in the left thigh twice, leading to him dying from an excessive blood loss. By 10.01am, the entire standoff was over. Around 300 officers were in the area at that point, and the two gunmen alone had fired over 1,100 rounds, making it one of the worst standoffs in American history. Of course, following the standoff, immediate changes were made. Firstly, the LAPD began having their officers armed with AR-15s in hostile scenarios, a trend that caught on across the country. SWAT officers also had their submachine weapons replaced with the same rifles. Then, the police investigation begins. On April 17th of that same year, officers raid an Anaheim home that they traced back to the two men. There they found incendiary ammunition, ballistic helmets, fink jackets, and nearly $400,000 in stolen cash. They also found multiple firearms, including high-power rifles. The U.S. Department of Defense would provide the LAPD with some 600 surplus M16 rifles around seven months after the incident, and these were then standard issued to every patrol sergeant. Furthermore, LAPD patrol cars began carrying AR-15 rifles also as standard issue. Officers replaced their ineffective Berettas with .45 ACP caliber semi-auto handguns, something only SWAT officers carried beforehand. In 1988, 18 LAPD officers would go on to receive the Medal of Valor for the bravery they displayed that fateful morning, meeting with then-President Bill Clinton afterwards. Stephen Yagman, a lawyer suing the LAPD on behalf of Matasaranu's children, claimed his rights as a citizen had been violated when officers purposefully allowed him to bleed to death, although the case was dropped by the gunman's children following a mistrial in March of 2001. In a deal with the police force, they agreed to drop the case so long as the officers were barred from counter-suing as a result of malicious prosecution to which both sides agreed. For many, the event serves as a reminder of that gruesome day. In just 44 minutes, one of the largest, bloodiest, and most violent standoffs in national history had taken place as the result of a botched bank robbery. In just 44 minutes of almost unending gunfire, two gunmen were dead and 18 civilians were wounded. Multiple vehicles were damaged, windows were shot into. It truly was a terrifying scene. And for just a brief 44 minutes, on the morning of February 28, 1997, North Hollywood, transformed into a war zone. So I was there then. Pretty mental. But only, uh, I'd only been there about a year, so that's maybe why I can't remember it. Yeah. But yeah, it answers to your question, why don't the police have... They got them now. They got, they got them, mm -hmm. yeah. Just wasn't Strange. thinking that far ahead. No. Didn't expect anything like that to happen. No. But who would though, do you no. know what I mean? Yeah. There's crazy people out there, isn't there? I don't know. Do I'm surprised no one died. Obviously, other than the, the two people that did it, the, no one. Yeah, civilians. Yeah, was civilians. Injured. Yeah. yeah. No police officers died. Police sure, officers. Sure, yeah, police officers oh, died. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Because yeah. they were saying, like, officer down yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, uh, I'm guessing, at least, yeah. 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 Crazy. Anyway, we learned a bit today. We didn't have a clue about that. No, before, we didn't. Did we? Yeah. No. We just seen it and thought, oh, the North Hollywood shootout. I wonder what this is. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Now yeah, we know. Good. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please like and subscribe, and we'll catch you on the next one. Cheers. Bye.